Well, good morning. It's a, a great honor and privilege to be with you here today. Uh, there was a couple questions as I was walking in this morning if this shirt was representing the Dolphins. And I want to be crystal clear. This is a combination of the Bills and the Eagles, where both of my heart's allegiance lie. It has nothing to do with the Dolphins. I did come here to prophesy, though, the Bills are going to get a victory today. Can I get an amen? <laughs> oh, boy. Again, all good sermons start as a, I don't know, a false prophet. I don't know, but... <laughs> but uh, for real, I am actually really grateful that you are here today and that you have taken time to prioritize time with God and with others. I think there's a lot of things in our lives and our world that can get our attention. And I, thinking, and I think that taking care of our soul is a really important thing. And so I'm really, really glad that you are here today. And uh, we are doing a two-week series on the topic of unsubscribing. And what we're talking about is getting rid of the things inside of our hearts and our souls that can lead to our own destruction. I think it's a really valuable and important thing for us to take time to do some self-assessment and to do some heart work. So we are going to do that together this morning. And to do so, uh, we are going to look at uh, what may be a familiar passage to you. Uh, and even if it's not, I think it's got some rich things for us to look at. Uh, so we'll have it on the screen. Or if you have your Bible or Bible app, you can open that up here. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This phrase, the sin that so easily entangles us. Have you ever felt that way in your own life? That you're just like, how, how did I get here? How did I, how did I end up lying to somebody that I love and care about so much? How did I lose my cool once again on my kids? How, how did that thought just come across my mind? Like, what is wrong with me? Some, something's messed up inside of me. Have you ever had those kind of thoughts or feelings or reactions? Well, one of the things that I find really helpful and comforting is that Scripture gives us language and description that we are not alone in these thoughts. Because I think that the enemy likes to, to make it so that we think we're the only ones who think and act this way. But Scripture gives us some real insights as to why do these, why do these wrong things that I do in my life keep showing up? Because it can be really frustrating for us when we get in that spot. And sometimes when those, uh, when those things that we know are out of bounds come up in our hearts and in our lives and they're revealed to us, either by others or by, by God, by ourselves, whatever, however we come to recognize them, sometimes it can be this moment that is conviction. And that is an actual really helpful thing. That like, I've done a bad thing and I, I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to make things right again. Like, that's, that's a good thing. But there's this other thing that can happen when we do something wrong in our, our life. And it's not, I did a bad thing. It's, I am a bad person. And that's where we could start to actually take on an identity that was never intended to be the identity that we grab a hold of. And what happens when we take on that kind of thought process is it, it leads to shame. And shame never leads to repentance, never leads us to living d differently. Conviction will, shame never does. And we've got to be careful uh, with, with that fine line between guilt and shame in our hearts and in our lives. But the truth is, there are definitely things in our hearts and in our lives that we need to unsubscribe from. Toxic things that can fill up our heads. And we took a look at this passage last week as well as we talked about this conversation. 
But I think it's important for us to look at it again. It's from Colossians 3, and I've got a few things underlined. These are, these are my underlines. I'm going to read portions of it to you. Um, just kidding. It's underlined on my notes, which... Uh, doesn't help you as much. Um, <laughs> but here's what it says. It says this. It says, put to death things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, skipping forward, to getting rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Do not lie. Later in the passage, it talks about be a person of forgiveness. Don't let un unforgiveness harbor up in your hearts. Now, there's this, there's this thing that uh, Christians or the Bible often gets uh, criticized for. And it's, it's this thing that it's like, you know, the Bible is good. It's got some good stuff in it. But really, like this is 2000 plus years old. Like we have learned a lot as humanity. And we've kind of progressed beyond this. We've learned a lot of things. We, like modern psychology and science has, has shown that like some of this is true, but not all of it. And talk about sexual immorality. Like who is, why does God care who I'm sleeping with? Like that seems like he's kind of controlling. Like this is my life, my body, my choices. Like I, this should be up to me for what for what I want. Like I live in the land of the free, freedom. And the truth is, is that when we think and live life this way, and when we view scripture through that lens, we miss the intention of God. You see, the, the reason that God tells us what is right and what is wrong is not out of control, it is out of love. It's the same reason why a parent would tell a toddler, don't reach your hand up and touch the stove. It's not because a parent's trying to create all of these rules for somebody. Shout out to my niece for modeling for us this morning so we can really make sure we remember this today. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> okay, but, but the reason that we, we have these boundaries is not out of control, it's out of love. And this passage lists out several things that can and will derail our lives if we don't keep them under check, if we don't unsubscribe from them. And sometimes I don't think we actually believe that it's true. But let's talk about sexual immorality. Don't sleep with people who aren't your spouse or you're going to leave other people in pain and ultimately it's going to lead to yourself being in pain. Or how about don't give in to rage? You're going to say things you didn't want to say in a tone, in a manner that you didn't want to say. And what that's going to do is that's going to create distance between you and other people. They're going to, they're going to be fearful of you. They're not going to want to be close to you. That's the outpouring of what happens when we let rage rule in our hearts and in our lives. Or how about lying? If you, if you talk, if you don't tell the truth, then what becomes of that is you people label you as not trustworthy. And again, what that does is it creates distance in your relationships. And, and ultimately what lying does is it leads to loneliness because people won't be close to you. And so, you know, sometimes for us, we think that if I can just do whatever I want, whenever I want, that is true freedom. And the truth is, is that when we live life, however we want, in whatever manner we want, it actually leads to this life that's all tangled up. And it sounds like freedom at the start, and that's what's sold to us in America, but it's not actually true. It leads to an entanglement. And so the reason that God gives us boundaries are not for control, it's for you and I, for our human flourishing. That's why he gives us these boundaries. And if we get the heart of God twisted, we're not going to trust God. So this is vitally important for us to understand and to let seep down into our hearts. Okay, so the sin that can so easily entangle, that can shipwreck our lives, what do we do about it? Well, the scripture gives us some great wisdom and insight on what to do. And it says this, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Throw off it's, it's an active resistance of getting it off of us. 
I love uh, Star Wars. I, I really love the first three movies created, episodes four, five, and six. And the, the whole premise, uh, you know, summarizing nine movies to you is the, in, in the early movies, they're called the rebellion and later they're called the resistance. Those are the good guys. They're trying to take down Darth Vader in the evil empire and trying to create freedom and justice for all. And one of the things that, that is true in the movies is that the resistance have a game plan for how they are going to get together as this ragtag group of people, underdog story, how they are gonna to come together and try to defeat the evil empire and, and remove the Death Star and, and all of it. But there is an active resistance that they are doing to the evil that is out there. And the truth is for you and me, there is evil out there but there's also evil that resides in here. And, and I think this is where we've got to do a heart check and recognize what, what is it that I can get entangled up in? I'm not saying you're a horrible person. I'm saying it's a sin that so easily can entangle our lives and shipwreck our destiny. And so what God wants for us is something better than that. And he wants to invite us to throw off the things that entangle us. I remember um, it, it was probably two years ago. I was sitting right over here. I just worshiped the Lord. He is good. And Pastor Bob is preaching a message, a sermon. And he's talking about, uh, I'm summarizing what he said, but it was about um, how the, the knowledge in scripture is really good. It's really helpful. And, and we need to let it seep into our hearts. But if we're not careful and we follow Jesus for a long time and we hear a bunch of sermons, that that knowledge can begin to puff us up and we can begin to become like the Pharisees, the old teachers, and, and we can begin to look down on other people. And it's not what the knowledge of God was intended for, but it can happen in our hearts and in our lives. And I remember sitting there thinking like, oh yeah, PB, get it. Get it. This is good. And I'm thinking, I'm like, there's a guy who's sitting way back there in the corner. I'm kind of like looking out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, man, he needs to hear this message. Like that is a message for him. Like I'm a PB, get it going right now. That's how the voice inside of me talks to Pastor Bob. I, I usually talk to him a little less dramatically. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this the whole way through. I'm thinking this for like 10 minutes as Pastor Bob is, is given a great message. And it dawns on me what has likely already dawned on you. Maybe I'm the one being a little bit judgmental right now of somebody else's struggle. And for the next five minutes of service, I didn't really listen to what was going on because I needed to talk to Jesus for a little bit. There, there was something that had grown inside of my heart that was not good and was not healthy. And I needed to repent. And I didn't go to that person and ask for forgiveness because I didn't think that was, would be the right play. But I did talk to my wife, a safe and trusted person afterwards. I said, hey, there's something inside of here that I had no idea was residing in here. Like this is, this is a total blind spot. I need, to help, I need you to help me see this. If this is gonna be coming in my mouth, in my mind, eventually that stuff's gonna start coming out of my mouth. I gotta unsubscribe from the toxicity of judgmentalism of somebody else for being judgmental. This is, this is no good. And so I took a moment and I talked to God and I talked to my wife. That was my way of throwing off the sin that can so easily entangle my heart and my life. I didn't even know it was there. And all of a sudden it pops up. This can happen for each and every one of us. And so what I want you to think about, if you haven't thought about it already, what is it that you need to unsubscribe from in your own heart, in your own life? And if you're not clear on it, I want to invite you to ask Jesus to reveal it to you. He is faithful to help us unsubscribe from the toxic things in our hearts, in our lives. Now, I, I want to uh, give us three things from this passage that I think will help us uh, unsubscribe and, and live a life of freedom from the things that can so easily entangle us. 
Now, um, of course, what we have to do is spend time with Jesus, spend time in his word, pray, be in community. If we're not getting the foundations right, it's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to become all that God has for us to become. And so I'm saying that briefly, but that is the foundation and important that we have to get that as we start it. But there's this other part of this conversation that I feel like gets missed often as we talk about unsubscribing and removing the garbage from our lives. And that is this, is that when we remove something unhealthy, we need to replace it with something that is healthy. Because if we don't, here's what we're at risk of doing, is we, we remove something that's unhealthy, and then if we don't replace it with something good and God-honoring, we just kind of either fall back into what was, or we fall and slip into something else that, again, is no good for our souls. There's this uh, second law of thermodynamics, and it, it states that as energy is transferred or transformed, more and more of it is wasted. Uh, another way to think about it is it's like, it's why you can't unscramble an egg and put it back together. Things can't move from a place of chaos to order without some sort of force coming in to put it back together. It's the same for us in our spiritual lives. If we are not intentional when we remove the garbage from our hearts, then if, if, if we don't do that, then something else garbage is just going to seep back in again. But there is something else that we can replace in our hearts and in our lives. And again, the scripture is so helpful for us in recognizing what it is that we need to do when we make the removal from our hearts. The passage we read says this, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So how do we remove the garbage once it's been removed? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We turn our eyes heavenward. And, and here's the thing is, for each and every one of us, if we want to make a change, and we want to make a lasting change, the way that we do this is we fall in love with Jesus. We fix our eyes on him. You know, our role as followers of Jesus is to enjoy God and to give him glory, to do all the work that we have for his glory. And I want to be really clear. This is not just a self-help talk for you to just really try harder in your life to be a better person. At the end of the day, the way that we become more like Jesus is we fix our eyes on Jesus. This is, this is a message for us to fall in love with the kingdom of God, of his ways being better and higher than ours ways. But I, but I do want to give this word of caution as we talk about fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because, and I think it's a really important one. And again, what can happen in, in these sorts of conversations is the enemy can kind of twist it in our minds. It takes a good thing and twists it and makes it all confusing. You see, we are not saved by the good things that we do. We are saved 100% by our faith and our trust that is put in Jesus Christ and him alone. Full stop. Like that's, that's it. But a life that follows after Jesus has fruit that comes out of it. And that's really what we are talking about today. We're talking about getting rid of the sin that so easily entangles our hearts and our lives. The, what, it, what it talks about in the scripture is that Jesus is the one that is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one. If you want to actually get rid of the sin in your life, we fix our eyes on Jesus because he is the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We can't just try to do this on our own or we're only going to do some good things for a little bit and it's going to trail off and we're going to find ourselves back in the same place again. I love how Paul kind of summarizes this whole message really well in one verse in a letter he wrote to the Corinthian church. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And the beautiful news for you and for me 
is that scripture tells us this, and let us run the race marked out for us. You have a God-given race. You, you have one. You have a purpose from God. And I know some days it doesn't feel like this. Some days it feels like you're just doing laundry and dishes and going to a job that feels boring and meaningless and all of it. And, and I, I hear you and I've experienced that. But, but I want you to know that God actually has a race. His word tells us a race that is marked out just for you. I remember um, way back in the day, back in high school, um, I used to be a cross country runner. And um, my, my seven-year-old daughter this week was, was giving me a hug. And I think we're like sharing this really sweet moment. And she says to me, Daddy, do you recognize that your belly's getting bigger? <laughs> I said, I, I didn't notice that. She's like, if you keep eating like that, you're going to look pregnant. <laughs> I'm like, all right, sweetie, <laughs> I, I'm going to need to get eye to eye here because Daddy's not offended right now, but if you say that to anybody else, it is not going to go well for you. <laughs> so uh, let, let me know if you need any other parenting tips. Like it's, it's going great at the Sigmund household here. <laughs> but I used to be a, a cross country runner and I was indeed thinner at the time. Uh, but I used, to, I used to love the competition. I used to love race day and getting amped up for it. Uh, I love the community that was built around it. And um, there, there was, every time we ran, it was a 5K race. There was a race that was marked out for us, and it was clear. And the truth is, is that for us as followers of Jesus, sometimes it can seem really clear, but sometimes, sometimes it feels a little unclear. Like, what, what is the race that God has marked out for us, for me? Like, I believe it, but, but how do I figure it out? Well, I could tell you this. Sometimes I know I've felt this way that it's like, okay, maybe, maybe each of us is supposed to like do, do something. Like we're all supposed to preach the gospel. Well, the, the truth is that not every person is called to stand on a stage and proclaim Jesus in this way that I'm doing right now. If that's not your calling, it's, it's not a lesser calling. But you do have a race to run and you do have a calling to live out. And that calling is to go and to make disciples everywhere that you go. You are called to encourage the discouraged. You are called to be a light in the places where it feels like it is only darkness that is winning the day. You are called to love the unlovable. You are called to love the people that drive you crazy. You are called to father the fatherless, to mother the orphan. You are called to work as if God was watching, not just your boss. You are called to partner with God in what he is doing in our world. You see, every one of us has a calling, has a purpose, and it is important. You have a race to run. And so my question for you to wrestle with today is what is that race that you have been called to do? And maybe for you right now, it's like super clear. You're already, you're already crystal clear on what to do. And in that case, this is just a conversation with God to help him help you be obedient to that race that you've been called to. But I, but I want to uh, give some practical application so it doesn't just seem all up here and uh, instead bring it, bring it down so that uh, you feel like you have something that you can walk away with that you can apply uh, tomorrow and today in your, in your workplace, in your world. So how do we answer this question? What is the race that is marked out for me? Here is one way to think about this. And the best way to always think about something is with a Venn diagram. That's just facts. Okay. So, um, and we're going to look at the overlap. Okay. So here, here is what it is. Look at what is God's heart in all of scripture. Look at your own giftings and how God has wired you. And then look at what breaks your heart. What breaks God's heart? What are the needs of the world? 
And then how do those three things intersect? That can give you help and wisdom to understand what is the race that is marked out for you. I even want to give you an example of um, the part, a piece of the component of the race that is marked out, I feel like for me, in this season. Okay? So I see in Scripture, Jesus has this incredible heart for children. Then for me, one of the things I love is sports and competition. I'm not the world's greatest athlete, but I love it. Okay? And then the needs of this world. I cannot stand the thought of any kid trying to navigate the darkness of this world on their own without Jesus. That is heartbreaking to me to think about any kid living that way. It can be a cold, dark world out there. And so for me, when I pair those three things together, it starts to help me understand what is a component of my race. And so what, what I have committed to in this last season of life is being a coach for the sports teams that my kids are on. Not every single one, but I, I probably coached 15 teams in the last six years for my kids. And of course, it's for connection with my kids, but I also want to be in proximity with a lot of other children, some of which go to church here, some of which don't, some know Jesus, some don't. And I will tell you, sometimes it feels very fruitful and sometimes it feels like, okay, I'm just running soccer drills and they, they can't really even pass it to each other yet. There's just this clump of kids running around a ball. And, and I, you know, but what I, what I understand and what I recognize and what I know is that this is part of the race that God has given to me. Because I have a dream in, inside of my heart, and it's grown ever since I moved to Rochester in 2009. And that is that every single kid at Churchville Chile, middle school, grade school, high school, would know and have access to Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, and as their helper as they go through all the hardships. But I'm not content with just one school. I want the homeschoolers to know. I want the Christian kids to know. I want Spencerport and Gates and Scottsville and Spencer, Spencerport. Did I say them again? Maybe they really need prayed for. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the Lord's just speaking. In Greece, I want inner city Rochester to know how good God is. I want the east side to know. And here's the good news is this is part of my race, but I don't have to do this race alone. I get to partner with each and every one of you to help our children know how good Jesus really is. And here is the, the beautiful thing, is that for me, I know I can't do anything to, to save a child. I really can't. But I want to put myself in proximity to be able to love kids who really need it and to look for opportunities where I can share the hope of Jesus that has changed my heart and has changed my life. That's part of my race. And so I want to encourage you today to think about this question. In fact, I'm gonna invite you to bow your heads and to close your eyes and to give you a moment to be able to reflect in this world filled with noise for a moment to be able to be quiet and silent with Jesus. And I want you to just talk about the two primary things that we've talked about today. What are the places in my heart where sin has so easily entangled my heart and my life that I need to unsubscribe from? What do I need to weed out? What needs plucked? And the second thing, what is the race that God has invited me to run? If it's unclear, ask for clarity. If it is clear, ask for obedience. I'm going to give you just a moment to be able to talk to Jesus, just you and him. He is trustworthy. He is here.
Would you stand with us? I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, would you help us? God, it, it seems so easily that we can derail our lives when we don't follow after you. And it seems like you could, this, this junk, this garbage can just so easily grab a hold of our hearts and our lives. But we want God to follow after you, to honor you, not so that we can feel like a good person, but so that we can live lives that bring you glory. So God, help us to remove the junk so that we can follow after your God-given purposes that you have for each and every one of us. Help us to see your vision more clearly and help us to walk it more faithfully. And all who agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Let's sing this out and declare this truth and solidify this in our hearts this morning.